Thank you very much, Annette, and with apologies for disturbing your postprandial afternoon snooze, um, and I hope that I managed to balance my laptop long enough to do the paper. Um, in the brief time I have at my disposal, I'd like to present a few aspects of how coin finds can cast some light on the shadowy world that existed beyond the Roman limes. The numismatic evidence is manifold and can illuminate many dark corners, but today I will be concentrating on just a couple of examples, and in particular on the period from the end of the 1st until the middle of the 3rd century AD, that is from the Roman advance across the Upper Rhine and Danube that led to the construction of the limes, and the final collapse of the Augustan monetary system in the AD 260s. The coinage of late antiquity was very different, and so I'll not be dealing with that. The two topics that I will be considering are Tacitus's comments in his Germania on how the inhabitants of Central Europe beyond the Limes understood and used Roman coins, so very much the colonial perspective you were talking about, and secondly, what coinage left the empire and the mechanisms by, why, by which it did so. In the past, evaluation of coin finds in the northern Barbaricum has tended to concentrate on coin hoards, neglecting single or stray finds. This was mainly due to the fact that while many hoards were published, there was no comprehensive inventory of single or stray finds from the region. This situation has changed with the publication of large-scale corpora of coin finds, and you can see the scale of coverage now for northern Germany, which allow us to look in detail at the evidence of spatial and temporal patterns across an extensive area of northwest and central Europe. Today I will be concentrating on that part of the Barbaricum which lies within the borders of the Federal Republic of Germany, what you see here. Uh, so let us start by looking at what Tacitus says about the use of Roman coin by those living beyond the Limes. You can see the text in translation on this slide here. Now this is a text that is frequently cited when the use of coinage by the Germani is discussed. But the question is, to what extent are ancient ethnological texts such as this, with their colonial perspective, reliable? Is it a sound summary of the situation in northern, central northern Europe in the second century AD? And what does Tacitus actually say? Now his main points are, he sees coins as primarily an economic or monetary phenomenon. The proximi, those who inhabited areas closer to the frontier, used gold and silver for commerce. They recognized different kinds of Roman coins. The interiores, on the other hand, who lived further away, relied on barter rather than coins for their transactions. And finally, that the Germani preferred silver to gold as it was better for everyday small-scale transactions. Now, before we start looking at his claims, perhaps it's useful to take a quick look at the Augustan um, coinage system, which is the basis of the coin finds we'll be looking at. The system had a wide range of denominations in four metals. On the left, you have the aureus in gold. Second from the left, the denarius in silver. Then you have the cistercius and the dupondius, uh, which are made of brass and will have actually looked golden. And finally, the ass. Yes, it doesn't like the font. Everything slipped over. Okay, great. Um, the ass, which is made of copper and will have looked red, actually like the euro coinage today. Now, if we look at all the single finds in the German barbaricum, in other words, with, without the hordes, then it is clear that just as Tacitus says, there is indeed a strong preference for silver. Here, the blue column representing the denarii. But what about the claim that there was a difference in coin use across the barbaricum? We can check this by looking at the coin finds from two areas, one close to the limes representing the proximi, and that is Thüringen here at the bottom, and one more distant area representing the interiores, in my case Mecklenburg-Vorpommern on the Baltic coast. And here you can see the range of denominations of the coin finds from the late 1st to the mid 3rd century AD in these two areas. Now while there are some differences, particularly in the level of Sestertii, these differences are in fact relatively small. The spectrum of denominations among the single finds is significant as it tells us something about how coins were being used. In a market economy based on the use of coins, we should expect large numbers of smaller denomination coins as they are more suitable for small, everyday transactions. The diagrams you see here are an indication that in this sense, there was little difference in the use of coins in the two areas. At risk of oversimplification, the evidence suggests that in neither area were coins actually being used for small-scale transactions. 
This impression is further strengthened when the figures for the Barbaricum are compared with the figures for the Roman provinces along the Rhine. Here, I have compared Mecklenburg-Vorpommern on the right with the area immediately to the south of the Lower Rhine in the province of Germania Inferior, which was the subject of a study by Joris Orts. What is immediately apparent is that at 75%, on the Baltic coast, the proportion of denarii, the blue line, is significantly higher than in the Roman province. And the figure is particularly revealing when we compare it with different contexts within the province. Low denomination coins are more common in the province in towns, less common in smaller towns, and even less common in rural settlements and villas. Clearly, the smaller denominations were being more widely used and therefore more frequently lost in towns than in the countryside. What this then tells us is that in the Barbaricum, the intensity of the use of small denominations was even lower than it was in rural areas of the northwestern provinces. This was in no means, by no means a monetarized economy in any sense of the phrase that we might understand it today. Clearly, when the coins left the Roman Empire, their use was being transformed and they were being used in a very different way in their new environment. The coin finds from the bog deposit of Illerup Ordal in Denmark provide us with an insight into this transformation and show us how coins were now being used outside the empire. Here in the third century AD, the equipment of a defeated Germanic war band was offered to the gods and deposited in the bog by the victors. This equipment included a number of denarii, which were generally found in groups that had probably been contained in small purses. And here you can see two examples. However, it would seem that only a relatively small number of members of the defeated war band actually had coins with them, indicating that they were available above all to higher status individuals. We should also note that in the Barbaricum, denarii were used extensively as a store of wealth, as is reflected in the huge number of denarius hoards that are known for northwest Germany, and here a map of denarius hoards from the area. Furthermore, the hoards reveal that, the denar that such denarii remained in use for a very long time, still being present in large numbers in hoards of the 4th century, that is, more than a century after they had disappeared from circulation within the empire. Here, for example, in the Lenigrish hoard from the mid to late 4th century AD. The most extreme example of this longevity is provided by the grave of the Frankish king Schilderich, who was buried in Tournai in Belgium in AD 481 or 482. The coins themselves have no longer survived, but according to the original records, alongside a number of 5th century Roman coins were some 200 silver coins, of which 41 denarii and one late Roman siliqua were identified. That the denarii survived so long and in such numbers indicates that they were not circulating intensively, but that exchanges were infrequent. This is what is to be expected of the kind of high-status exchange that is suggested by the coins from Elorup Ardal. If they had been passing more frequently from hand to hand in everyday transactions, then we would expect them to be subjected to more intensive loss, and so to disappear from circulation more quickly, which they do not do. The transformation in the function of the coins when they left an empire also saw them being used increasingly as jewellery. Gold coins are often pierced in order to be worn as personal adornments. Interestingly, silver coins were not used in this way during the Roman Iron Age. Later it's a different story. Suggesting that the two metals were circulating in different spheres. Silver as an object of material value, gold more as a prestige good and a marker of status. A bit of an oversimplification, but I think you get it. We should also note that when gold coins are pierced, then they are almost always pierced so the emperor's head is correctly oriented. This raises interesting questions of Germanic identity and what exactly Germani, who wore such adornments, were trying to express. But unfortunately, I can't go into that in any detail today. In brief, we can state that it was not as a medium for market exchange in a monetarized economy that the Germani employed Roman coins. Upon crossing the limes, their function was significantly transformed. They were no longer the general purpose money of the empire that could be used across a wide range of transactions and functions from the marketplace and tavern to the purchase of the imperial throne. In the Barbaricum, their role was more restricted. 
Silver was now used primarily as a means of storing and transferring wealth within a specific milieu. They will have been, silver coins will have been used um, mainly in high status exchange, for example, diplomatic payments, tributes, diaries, etc. Gold coin, gold could also be used as a visible badge of status. As such, coins became an integral part of the power structures of Germanic society and will have played a significant role in maintaining and transforming them. Now, the role of coins within these power structures is closely related to the second point I would like to consider, the question of why and when Denarii left the empire. The long-standing view was that the influx was a commercial or economic phenomenon, with the Denarii leaving mainly as the result of trade. However, more recently, scholars such as Alexander Burscher and Michel Erdrich have focused on the role of Rome's external politics, and in particular on diplomatic payments and subsidies. They see the coins as conscious payments made by Rome to secure the allegiance of Germanic groupings and thus ensure the security of the northern frontier. Early work on the subject, of, uh, on the subject was based mainly on the hoard evidence. The hoards in indicate a significant influx of denarii into the Barbaricum during the second century AD that ended suddenly at the beginning of the reign of Septimius Severus in the early 190s. This break was generally interpreted as a reaction to the significant reduction in fineness of the denarius that took place early in the reign of Septimius Severus, who reduced the silver content from 66 to 46%. It is suggested that the Germani, with their love of silver, rejected the less fine coins, accepting only older, better quality denarii. On this interpretation, the break in the outflow of denarii was, in was initiated by the Germani, who are seen as the active agents. However, if we look not at the hordes but the single fines, then a very different picture emerges and the situation is even more complicated. Taking the single fines globally across the Germ German barbaricum, the break in the outflow of denarii at the end of the second century, while still apparent, is by no means as marked as it is for the hordes. There is the same reduction from Marcus Aurelius to that to, to Commodus, However, there is no reduction from the reign of Commodus to that of Septimius Severus. The reduction in the fineness of the denarii seems to have had no effect on the single fines. If we then look at the single fines not at a global, but at a regional level, then differences become apparent. For example, in Lower Saxony, that is northwest Germany, there is a dramatic drop in the number of denarii from the reign up to into the reign of Commodus and, and thereafter. Um, how, um, sorry. Um, um, and interestingly, then a significant rise in AD 222. In Thuringen, on the other hand, the drop comes later and the end of the reign of, at the end of the reign of Commodus and is less extreme. So in Thuringen, things carry on more smoothly. Quite clearly, there is no monocausal explanation for the drop in the number of denarii leaving the empire. Above all, it cannot be simply the result of the inhabitants of the northern barbaricum rejecting denarii with a lower silver content after the reduction in fineness under Septimius Severus, nor can there have been a blanket reduction in the level of payments to all of the Germani. The situation was more complex. Returning now to the role of Roman diplomacy and subsidies, and we heard about this this morning, Hans Ulrich Voss will be drawing attention tomorrow in a paper that Following the Marcomannic Wars of the late second century, there was a significant realignment of Roman-Germanic Roman alliances. And I would like to suggest that this realignment had significant effects on the direction and intensity of the flow of coinage, and that Thuringen played an important role in this realignment. Not only did denarii continue to flow into the area in large numbers, at this time we can also see the development of a significant centre of power there that is expressed in the rich burials of, for example, the Hasleben Leuna group, as seen here in the burials from Dienstedt and Gommern. Evidence for how this realignment worked is probably to be seen in the recently discovered battlefield site at Hart's Horn. It was a great surprise when metal detectorists started finding early 3rd century Roman military equipment some 150 kilometers north of the Limes. The small numbers of coins among the finds indicate that the battlefield in all likelihood is related to the campaigns of Maximinus Thrax. Clearly, the Roman army was operating much further from the Limes than had previously been realized. Such an undertaking will only have been possible with the support of allied groupings among, along the supply routes, 
and in the rear of the area in which the Roman army was operating. Thüringen will have played an important role here and reflects the success of the Roman policy of concentrating the payment of subsidies in the form of coin in the area. So summing up some of my main points briefly, coins were an important tool of Rome's external politics, entering the barbaricum primarily as payments to secure alliances. Here, Rome was the active agent. But once the coins had left the empire, they were transformed and the Germani used them very differently. Germanic agency led to them becoming an important part of the power structures of indigenous society. As for Tacitus and his colonial view, to some extent he was right. The Germani did prefer silver, and Rome exported mainly silver coin. This silver did have an economic function, but it was in a very different way to the function of silver within the empire. We can also observe a difference in the way different metals were used, and gold could be adapted to other non-economic functions. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.